Right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Dave Clark and it's my pleasure to join you on International Microorganism Day 2020. I hope wherever in the world you're watching this from, you're keeping safe and well. Um, so, my name is Dave Clark, as I mentioned. I'm a research scientist at the University of Essex in the east of England. Um, I'm a microbial ecologist, which means that most of my research revolves around uh, the two sort of broad questions of why do microorganisms live where they do and what are they doing there? What benefits or what processes are they contributing to in the environment? And to answer these questions, I get to play some pretty cool toys. So I get to use uh, DNA sequences and cluster computers to perform experiments and analyses that even as little as 10 to 15 years ago weren't really possible. Um, this is a pre-recorded talk, so unfortunately there's no time for sort of live questions at the end, I'm afraid. But I am on Twitter at Microbe Ecology, um, and I'd love to hear from anyone with questions. So please feel free to reach out and get in touch if you have any questions. So obviously microorganisms have been getting a bit of a bad press recently. Um, the current COVID pandemic, of course, has completely changed all of our lives and the way we, we go about our daily lives. Um, but I wanted to talk about a group of microorganisms that I think are really, really cool. Um, and the reasons why I think they're such an exciting group of organisms to study. So if you're watching some of the other talks on International Microorganism Day, then you probably already have a bit of an idea about what microorganisms actually are. Um, but for those of you who might not have seen the talks, then I'll present a sort of brief summary. So obviously the first thing about all microorganisms is that they're very small. So that means they're mostly single celled organisms or unicellular. Um, as opposed to humans, we have several trillion cells that make up our bodies. They're also incredibly abundant. So the human population on Earth at the moment is about 7.8 billion people. If you go into your garden or into your local park or wherever and pick up a handful of healthy soil, there will probably be more microorganisms in that handful of soil than there have been people that have ever lived. I think mean, that's pretty amazing. And most life on Earth is microbial. So we estimate that the number of microbial species is actually greater than the number of stars in our galaxy. But what actually are microorganisms? Well, they're sort of divided into three main groups. So we have the bacteria that most people have heard of. These include things like E. coli. Then we have the archaea, and then we have the eukaryotes. And of course, we as animals are eukaryotes, like all other animals, and all other plants. So most of the living things you see in your daily lives are eukaryotes, but there are also many microbial eukaryotes, so things like diatoms and single-celled algae. But the one thing that really unites microorganisms is that they are absolutely everywhere. So as you're watching this, the surface of your skin and the inside of your body and your gut are absolutely crawling with microorganisms. In fact, probably about 50% of the cells in your body are actually non-human, actually microorganisms. Similarly, the waters around you, the seas, the lakes, the rivers, surfaces and insides of plants, um, even the very air you breathe is, is home to microorganisms. And when I say they live everywhere, they really are everywhere. So even in very extreme environments, such as those that are very salty. And we call these environments hypersaline. And these can be a real variety of habitats. So these can be as large as the Dead Sea or as small as an evaporating rock pool on your local beach. They can be warm, like the Mediterranean, or they can be cold. So there's even hypersaline environments in 
the Arctic and Antarctic regions. And they can be natural or they can be human made, like salt pans where we gather sea salt. And these hypersaline environments are all colonized by microorganisms. And we call these microorganisms halophiles, which means they love salt. So what actually are halophiles? Well, most of them are actually archaea. So most of the species and most of the cells that we find in these environments are archaea. We also find bacteria to a lesser extent and more rarely eukarya. So most of the eukarya we find belong to a single type of algae called Danaliella. In my opinion, the most amazing of these organisms is this organism. This is called Haloquadratum walsbii. And this is a type of archaea that is absolutely unique because it has square cells. And as these cells reproduce, they form sheets that look like little window panes. And this is absolutely unique in nature. You can also see halophiles from space. So this is a satellite image of Lake Tyrrell in the southeast of Australia. And like many salt lakes throughout the world, you can see it has this pinkish and even these dark red hues. And this is caused by the dense blooms of halophiles that live in these waters. And the reason they're these colours is because many halophiles make pigments, so often pinks and reds and greens, and that acts like a sunscreen which protects them from the high UV radiation that they experience in these very exposed environments. Halophiles, of course, in that they love salt, can occupy environments that are much, much saltier than seawater. So seawater is approximately 3.5% salt. Halophiles will happily live in environments up to about 40% salt, so about 10 times saltier than seawater. So how do they do this? Well, Let's first of all look at what happens if we placed a normal microorganism in a hypersaline environment. So I've represented here a microbial cell, the, say an E. coli cell, as this pink rectangle. And if we placed it in a hypersaline environment, what would happen is that because the water inside the cell is far less salty than the water outside the cell, there would be a net movement of water from inside the cell to outside. That would cause the cell to shrivel up and pretty rapidly it would die. Halophiles actually have two main strategies of coping with the high salt concentration in their environment. And these are compatible solutes or what we call the salt in strategy. So most moderate halophiles actually use this compatible solute strategy. So here the cell actually makes chemicals inside it that help balance the salt concentration inside and outside of the cell and retains water that way. But this is very costly for the cell. The cell has to spend energy and resources making these chemicals. So you'll find that most extreme halophiles, the ones that live in the saltiest environments, actually prefer this salt in strategy. So rather than synthesizing these chemicals inside the cell, these halophiles actually pump salt into their cells. This has the effect of equalizing the salt concentration inside and outside of the cell, and thus keeps water inside. The disadvantage is that these cells have to have proteins and cellular machinery that make the cell work that are very well adapted to high salt, and as such it means they can't really live anywhere else. So one of the things about hypersaline environments is that they often experience really high evaporation. They're often in very hot places and very exposed places, and as such the, the brine, briny waters tend to evaporate very quickly. Now as the brine evaporates, the remaining brine becomes what we call chaotropic, 
So that means that the salts that are left in the brine as it begins to evaporate are very damaging to the cell. They can disrupt the cell membrane and cause the cell to die. So how do microorganisms cope with this? Well, I think the coolest strategy um, is that many microorganisms can actually entomb themselves within forming salt crystals. So as the brine becomes more and more concentrated as it evaporates, salt crystals begin to form. And inside these crystals, there can be little pockets of fluid. And in these pockets of fluid, microorganisms can sort of hide themselves away inside the crystal in, in, and wait for either rains or tides to come and refresh the brine, in which case the salt crystal dissolves and the microorganism can carry on as normal. So to give you a sense of scale, a microorganism in one of these brine pockets inside a salt crystal is approximately the same as one of us standing in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So here's an image um, of one of the PhD students in our group has generated. So she's taken some brine from a natural environment and left it to evaporate and it's formed these salt crystals. And as you can see, these crystals have the characteristic sort of pink hues inside them that tell us that there are lots and lots of halophiles entombed inside them. It's a really cool image. And this is something that we at Essex have been very interested in, particularly um, the question of can all halophiles survive in salt crystals or is it just a small proportion of the community and species? So to answer this question, um, a former master student, Tom Huby, conducted a really cool little experiment. So he took brines from this salt pan in Sicily and he brought them back to the lab and let them evaporate in petri dishes. And after one week, three weeks, eight weeks, and 21 weeks, he would take samples of the salt crystals and he would dissolve these and look at the microbial community that had been entombed with inside these crystals. And what he found was really interesting. So actually a very high proportion of the community that's in these initial brines was also there after 21 weeks and the number of cells that were in these brines was practically identical after 21 weeks. So it tells us that actually a very high proportion of the community in these initial brines is capable of surviving inside the crystals, at least over the duration of a few months. But what happens if these brines don't get refreshed? What happens if the rains never re-dissolve these salt crystals or if the tides don't return? Well, one of the things that can happen is that these salt crystals eventually become buried and fossilized. And they can remain fossilized for millions and millions of years. And Probably the most remarkable thing about microorganisms and particularly halophiles is that some of them can actually survive inside salt crystals buried under the ground for millions and millions of years. And we actually have reasonably strong evidence now um, of halophiles being revived from ancient salts as old as 260 million years. So just stop and think about that for a moment. That means that there are microorganisms buried deep within the earth that have been buried inside salt crystals since before the time of the dinosaurs. I think that's just mind blowing personally. And it also means that they're probably the oldest organisms on earth. We know of some trees that can reach thousands of years old, but definitely nothing as old as the halophiles. The other interesting thing about this ability to entomb themselves within salt crystals and survive over millions of years is that we know that other planets and stars in our solar system have large deposits of evaporite minerals 
So for example, salt is an evaporite mineral. It's formed by the evaporation of water. And we know that planets like Mars have large deposits of other minerals such as gypsum, which is also formed from evaporation. So could these gypsum deposits preserve alien microorganisms from a time when Mars had large expanses of water on its surface? It's a really interesting question and it's one that current Mars expeditions are trying to answer. There's a number of expeditions to try and find signatures of, of life on Mars. So I hope that that was interesting. It was a brief snapshot into why I love microorganisms so much and particularly halophiles. Um, I want to thank in particular Professor Terry McGinnity, who is also giving a talk on microorganism day, so please check out his, his talk. Um, as well as Miriam Magula and Tom Hubie for their work in, in the lab, in our group. As I said at the beginning, please feel free to send me any questions via Twitter. I'm more than happy to, to receive questions. And if you'd like to find out a little bit more about my research, I've put a link to my personal website here. So feel free to check it out. Other than that, please have a fantastic International Microorganism Day. Keep safe. And I hope you find all the other talks really interesting. Thank you very much.